Bombshell Brunches, where your hosts Raquel Rodenberg and Christina Lau sip and spill with badass babes every Tuesday morning. I'm so excited. We just had like two minutes of conversation before we started <laughs> and Raquel and I are just buzzing. We're like, why do you not live here with us? Uh next door so we can constantly be energized uh I just want to I mean it's the least I could do yeah right exactly come on (laughs) come come back uh I want to introduce you all to Dr Ashley Margeson and it I just I I'm gonna just run through this as quickly as I can because it's absolutely sickening how how high an achiever you are so uh fasten your seatbelts everyone Dr. Ashley Margison is an impact entrepreneur, a naturopathic doctor, and a questioner with an unshakable thirst for diving deep into helping you become the person you were always meant to be. She's obsessed with periods and the role they play in our lives. She successfully built a million dollar business before the age of 30, bleh, trying not to be <laughs> envious, and is the founder and host of the Superwoman Code podcast, bleh, want to be you now, uh, a place for women <laughs> who want to thrive and live their lives on their terms. Clinically, she helps women bounce back from burnout, thank you, balance their hormones and design a life where their health works for them, not against them. She's been named one of Atlantic's, uh, Atlantic Canada's top 50 under 40 year olds and is one of the youngest members of the Women's President's Organization. Come on. And if that wasn't enough, she's just launched her course, The Burnout Blueprint, and uh, I'm going to now spend the rest of this episode swooning. Just swooning. And Just swooning. I feel you. like I'm swooning over you all as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though when we like when we like list all of these achievements and things, and you're like, but it really doesn't matter because it kind of just matters that I want to curl up in my sweatpants and drink a lovely glass of wine, and that's actually what I want to do at the end of the this, day, right? This is exactly why you are on this podcast, <laughs> right? She's our spirit animal. <laughs> you can't really do it all. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Oh, I wish I had a mimosa right now, but I had too many red wines yesterday. So I'm trying. I to almost be. poured a wine for this episode, but oh. I didn't. I, yeah, well, you I could. Was like, I was Amsterdam. like, can I pour a glass of wine? You know, I was can. Like, I was Girl, like, you yeah, can no. do what you want. <laughs> I was like, I'll get my, I'll get my water into me and then I'll have a glass of wine that, later. That's do you guys ever do naughty drinking? What is that? Naughty drinking? Like, okay. So I don't drink a lot. But when I do, when I have a hankering for a drink, I just want to have it on my own terms. And so I find there's all of these like societal rules about when you can drink, like it has to be afternoon, blah, blah, blah. Right. And sometimes I just want to make pancakes and have a beer. Oh. Why can't I do that? Why I mean, can't you totally I? totally could. Have I'm having less than most people. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes I make pancakes with a beer. <laughs> I don't know, like... My favorite thing about the summer, though, is because it's actually like societally acceptable to start yes. drinking at 10 a.m. Except I mean, like, I was like, I just want like an Aperol spritz. Yeah. And that's just, I just want one, but I just want to yes. sip on it all day. Like, I don't right. want to have, I don't want to get drunk. I don't want to do a million different things. I just want to have one glass of wine that nurses me through the day. And mm-hmm. you should just be able to do that. You mm-hmm. just need to live your truth. And that's an <laughs> exactly. Aperol spritz to sip on throughout the day. People need to just <laughs> let this happen. Yeah. So there we go. Let's just With those rocks that don't melt, like the ice rocks that don't melt so that you're not ever, it's not like doing that weird sweaty thing where it, then you're like, well, now I mean, I'm like, drinking Aperol water. Exactly. I'm notorious for just freezing a pile of grapes and then dumping mm. them in. Oh, that works. smart. That's really nice. Oh, yeah, that's really nice. okay. Dang. Well, now we've established that we're all just going to leave this today and uh, get ourselves uh, uh, beer fine. or mimosa it's or apple. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. So that's how to avoid burnout. Drink. Yes. <laughs> just numb it. Just that numb it. Just it's fine. Oh, the doctor's orders. If we can't think about it, then it's not actually happening. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, I love this. Uh, okay. So. So I hi, thanks all... for having me on to the podcast. That was like the best introduction I think I've ever had. <laughs> Just me going, what? <laughs> she does this, what? Uh, yeah, right? We, no, Crazy. we're so happy to have you. And I actually did want to shout out um, because it was, we, it wasn't us that found you. 
No, we we found you. Yeah. I know. And I love that. Crystal Richard. Shout out to Crystal Richard. So Crystal's uh, literally my spirit animal. And we've oh. been searching around for really kick-ass podcasts that we wanted to have this conversation with. Uh, and so we managed to find you guys and we popped in oh. the album. Oh, I know. Our, our little, my dark little heart is just so happy. <laughs> oh, so happy. Uh, so let's get the background. Let's get the, let's get the background on, on you just a little bit less formally. Like, where did you grow up? How did you get into, into, into naturopathic work? Like, and especially niching in women, because you've had, you've had your work highlighted in New York Magazine and Cosmo on CTV, Bustle, like all these places and spaces Tell, tell us, just speak what, tell, tell us everything. <laughs> tell us everything. <laughs> um, so I'm a, I'm an East coaster. We call ourselves blue nosers at heart. Um, and so if you've ever been to Canada, our dime has a, a little tiny ship on it and that's the blue nose. Um, oh. and basically it was the fastest racing ship in the world. And so I'm from a part of the country where we, um, our lobsters are considered to be poor man's food. Um, literally, <laughs> Wow. And we just, we, we developed like the sea shanties before they were a thing on TikTok. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I grew up surrounded by lobster boats and, and fishing and, um, you know, hit grade seven and everybody was talking about sex ed and nobody wanted to talk about, you know, you just got told that there was this week of the month that you had to deal with, with, and it was the worst thing ever. And my grade seven brain went like, but there's four weeks in a month. So what's going on with the other three? <laughs> that's a wow. smart grade seven. Can I just right? say that's a smart grade seven? <laughs> I was like, but there's three more weeks. So like, what else is happening? And nobody could tell me anything. They were like, oh, well, you don't have to worry about that because you just you don't get pregnant and you get your period, which is what drives me nuts about sex education these days is we basically tell girls to not get pregnant. And then when they hit their thirties and they get, you know, in a long-term relationship, we ask them why they're not pregnant yet. Oh, right. And so like, I was like, that doesn't make sense. I was just like, let's just talk about it. Um, so I stayed kind of relatively close to my little community, my whole life, and then ended up at university and, and studied dietetics and, and knew that I just didn't want to talk about nutrition one-on-one all day. Mm -hmm. Um, and so moved to the big city of Toronto because an ex-boyfriend's mom told me about this program called naturopathic medicine. Um, and I thought it was the craziest thing in the world. And I was like, there's no research behind this. Like, (laughs) and then did what my grade seven brain did and was like, well, I should, before I say there's no research behind this, I should probably prove myself right. Um, and then prove myself wrong, (laughs) literally, um, and figured I didn't have anything to lose other than potentially just a year and And lobsters and and all the lobsters. (laughs) fishing boats and a massive ocean playground. Um, And so I moved to Toronto and ended up finishing my four-year degree. And then as I was coming back, I was just like, okay, so I love working one-on-one with people. It's great. It's, it's invigorating. It's empowering. It's amazing to see people who haven't been able to get pregnant, get pregnant. And then people who didn't have energy, have energy. And all of a sudden, like you're changing your life because you actually feel like you have the ability to change your life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I still had that nagging thing at the back of my head being like, but like, what do hormones actually do? Like we talk about them in the sense of like, there's a fluctuation. You get pregnant at this point, you can not get pregnant and have a period at this point, but like, what does it actually mean? And, and so I, I consider periods to be a fifth vital sign. So we take our blood pressure, we take our heart rate, we take our breathing rates in medicine. We kind of get a sense of what's going on. For women, our periods are our fifth vital sign. Like it tells us every single month basically how well our bodies are coping with things. And so as you know, we developed out our work in burnout and we developed out our work in helping people optimize their health, hormones and periods became to the very base of that because that's how we all tick. Mm-hmm. And so my little grade seven nerdy science girl <laughs> actually started to figure out like what hormones actually meant for our day to day. And so that's what I get to do every single day with my patients. And, and that's the base of what burnout blueprint is, is built on. And, and as we're developing that through, we're, we're developing through other online courses so that people who aren't in our little tiny community can access the research and the education about it. 
Oh, I just adore you. Oh my God. <laughs> Like that's awful. Yeah. And then on top of that, I like very happily like long-term partner and, and my two step kids and, and you know, it's, it's just fun. We have a duck toller who is the most highest energy dog in the world. Um, and it's just fun. Oh, I'm so, I'm so excited to dig into hormones. So I first started reading about basically how the cycle can affect different aspects of your life. I think I first read something maybe eight years ago. It was one article Mm -hmm. and never read about it since. It was so like not talked about. And I can't remember at all where I read it, but I thought it was really interesting because they were talking about structuring your work so you could have like your creative work done at a certain time of the month because you're going to be more likely to be most creative at that point. now it seems to be starting to move into the limelight a little bit more. Um, I also saw recently I downloaded the Nike Fit app after having deleted it for a while because you know mm-hmm. it's quarantine and I need to get stay in shape. You're like, I need to move. <laughs> yeah, Something this, this needs, needs to give to me happen. some sort of energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but they have a a workout now that is based on your cycle. Right. So it's amazing. Can you Tell us about this. Like, just tell us about hormones. What happens? Why does your energy change? What is PMS? Why do people get PMS? Because I feel like that's the only thing oh that my God. people care about. They're like, <laughs> PMS, and that's it. And no, there's so much more. Well, it's because like we forget that women literally aren't supposed to be the same every single day. Like we have this idea that we're supposed to wake up and feel the same every single day and we're supposed to do the same things and we're supposed to have the same amount of energy and like newsflash, like we're not, like we're not 24 hour creatures. We're 24 day creatures or we're 28 day creatures or we're 36 day creatures. Like it's, our, our bodies and our hormones are built to have us continually be fluctuating. And so basically there's, so it's okay to feel different every single day. And that's actually a really important part of your hormones being balanced is that you actually feel different. Um, and so what we do is we kind of separate your cycle into two halves. So we call one, the follicular phase and the other, the luteal phase. And the follicular phase is what we call the first half of your cycle. So the follicle is developing in the follicular phase. And then in the second half of your cycle, that follicle or that egg has been released. And it's basically, does it get in like, can this is something being made or not? Um, and so the luteal phase is we is where we tend to get a lot more hormonal fluctuations. And so we tend to see PMS um, happen at that point. But I have patients and, and the research is here too, where you get your worst PMS symptoms at ovulation or you get it right after your period. And so this idea that PMS is just before your cycle is actually, or your period flow is not actually a thing. And so when you're in the first half of your cycle, this is basically when your estrogen is rising. And estrogen is a really important hormone. Like it gets a lot of hate, but it really shouldn't. Um, And so estrogen is basically what's giving your body extra energy to do things. So our cycle day one is when we have our our heaviest flow on on our period. And that's just where we've always counted from. It's just, it's an easy visual cue. You can technically start your cycle whenever you want. It's just, you shift where things are sitting. Um, So you should generally have about a four to five, sometimes a six day flow. It should start off lightly, then it gets heavy for a couple of days and then it lightens out again. Um, low grade cramps are no big deal, but anything more than needing to take an Advil or a, or a Midol or an or ibuprofen for like one or two times a day on those heavy days is actually more than you should be experiencing. Um, come day three of your cycle, your estrogen starting to rise and estrogen is your creative superpower. So when you're in the first half of your cycle, you're getting a higher serotonin load in your brain. And so the more estrogen we have, the more serotonin we have. 
Serotonin is our get stuff done, make us feel good, give us positive and reinforcement up to our brain. And so as we're in this kind of estrogen surging moment of our cycle, we're better brainstormers. We're more apt to want to connect ideas together. If you're writing an article, this is when you want to think about like all, like how you want it to flow. It's the best time to do a podcast. It's when we have the ability to kind of look at people and go, okay, this makes sense. Here's this connection. Here's another connection. Let's see what this could look like. Wow. Um, right? Like it's wow. really, yeah. My mind is just blown right now. I'm just like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I have to live my life. Now I want to be this person. Now I've got to live my life by their schedule. As are you, Do we just sign up to the cult at the end of this? Like, oh, I'm well, in. I mean, I'm like in. I'm totally there already. <laughs> But like, it, it, and this is the interesting part of it is people go, so I do my creative stuff at this point. And I'm like, not necessarily. You work your day to day so that if you have the capacity to do your creative stuff at this point, mm. you do it because it takes less energy because you're already yeah. in that mode. It's not to say that you can't do it later. It's just to say that it's easier to do because this is when the hormones are synced up to be able to help you do it. And this and is so, biohacking. This is biohacking. This is for, this for, is for biohacking, literally. Mm. Um, because true biohacking is just taking what's already happening naturally and just elevating it. And yeah. so w- women are technically really good biohackers when we know what's going on with our cycle. It's just we haven't ever talked about it in a way that makes sense. And there's right? a level of like shame around it. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, oh, there's yeah. so much shame around it. And Yeah, I think that's a big reason why people weren't talking about it as well. But this is amazing. Like, how we're like, and we're like three white women talking about this too, recognizing that there is a level of privilege that comes along with being able to talk about it in that sense. Like, um, women who have like African American women or Indian women or kind of Middle Eastern maces have a much different approach and a lack of research around kind of what our hormonal cascades look like and how they differ between cultures and, and, well, and where yeah, people's I'm, genetics are from. I'm Eurasian. So I'm mixed race. So yeah, there's a very different, like Chinese, I have Chinese Nepalese heritage and mm-hmm. yeah, it's just a different, it's a totally different conversation. Right. And, and it age has wise to, too. And mm-hmm. age wise, and it has to be yeah. a different conversation. And mm-hmm. so we have to recognize that like, we can't label kind of one woman's type of research onto all kinds of different types of, re- of women. Mm. And so we have to just recognize that as we move through this conversation that yes, this is what the general trend looks like, but it can be very different depending on genetics. Mm. And that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Like, mm-hmm. ha- give me some examples of that. Well, okay. So this is, and this is the interesting part about it is we just have a lack of data in hormones with women. And so we generally, when we research women, we a haven't researched women for a long time. We just assume that the research that we got from generally white men was applicable to women. Turns out that's not the case. What? (laughs) What? We're not the same. That's not actually true. Like women aren't just small men. Um, And so, (laughs) shocker. Newsflash. Yeah, newsflash. And so then we kind of turned in as we were doing research. A lot of research um, is is funded out of the UK or is funded out of the USA. And so those are our big kind of global research centers. And so we're going to naturally have an inclination to study people in those populations because it's easier to access. Um, And so we see a lot of research on kind of optimization of hormones or natural cycles or et cetera, coming from the UK and USA populations. But then we have a lot of research on cycles and how it affects poverty and how it affects kind of women in villages and raising communities coming from our like sub-Saharan African populations and our, our endemic Middle Eastern populations. And so what we're getting is getting one end of kind of the range of, of, you know, like there's so much shame around periods and there's so much period poverty. And then we have the opposite end of the range where people are going like, well, I don't want to talk about birth control because I want to sink in naturally. And you know, this woman who now has 10 kids is like, I just, I want to not have more kids. 
And so we're missing this huge gap in the middle of, right. of what it looks like for women in a different populations, but B who aren't kind of the, your privileged population, but then very underserved population, which arguably is about 60% of the world. Yeah. And so it's not even that it's different. It's that we just don't know. Right. And we, like, we haven't studied that population in the way that we need to study to be able to make these kind of long-standing trends and, and long-standing data research. And so it's, it's, and I always say like a lack of data doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means there's a lack of data. And so mm-hmm. it's one of the things that I think we have to do better is go like, no, we need to research women in a way that we're, we're researching all women, not just the most easily accessible women. Yeah. It's so important too, because I have a lot of friends who are Asian and they said um, that birth control does not, or a lot of like oral birth control does not work well for them. Genetics are different. You break down hormones. If it's coming in orally, it's medication. So it gets broken down through the liver liver completely differently Mm -hmm. than it would if you had, you know, different genetics than kind of Asian ancestry. And this is just something that like, I just, I blatantly talk about with my patients because I'm like, I need to know what your genetics are because that could influence what type of birth control you might need to use or how strong your inflammatory cascades are, or are you more likely to get PMDD or PMS or, you know, are you more likely to have fibroids? Like we know that, that women with a, with a, an African kind of Canadian or African American heritage, um, in terms of genetics are more likely to develop fibroids at an earlier age, but all of the research is done on white women. And so generally you don't see that kind of fibroid development until 42, 43, 44, whereas in kind of the African American, American genetics, you'll see that happen at like 28, 29, 30. And so you see women who this is getting missed, because the data says that it shouldn't happen until they're 15 years older, but the actual data says it should be happening right now. And we're just not following it. And so we're not educating people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Not asking people about their, their heritage and their background. I mean, I remember in the UK I'd give blood and they would ask, like, you'd have to put your, your heritage. It's not that difficult to put that onto other things. Like I'd always have to check the mixed race box and the Asian, like where your family is from. Right. And I think that's a, a, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, I don't really want to ask that question, but it's like, well, no, this is a contextual thing. I think it's really important to know. And I think they do ask the question. The problem is when you're doing big studies like that, you don't always have access to the range. So I know my Mm. university, we do a lot of studies, but you're limited by financial resources, by time, um, I by mean, access. Time, yeah, mm-hmm. by access. Like it can be really difficult to um, get the population that you want. And so you're just building these small building blocks each time and you can only take it like a centimeter further each time, mm-hmm. <laughs> each but study. Good, but good research is also built on like, we know we're only going to move this a millimeter or a centimeter, yeah. but this is a really critical baseline. So we mm-hmm. need to get it. Um, but then, you know, you get these media headlines and it's like this broad sweeping claim and you're like, that's not what the research yeah. paper actually yeah. showed. <laughs> or like, oh. yes, but only for the specific data. So, Sorry. We just went on a break. We break huge <laughs> no, loops. We we do loops. We, yeah. we do loops here. There you go. <laughs> I do want to ask though, like, so so on that note, before mm-hmm. um, before we go any further, I, I just want to jump in and say, okay, so what do you do? What's your process like when you treat somebody? When you take a client on, uh, can you kind of like just walk us through your magic, your magic, my, my magic spells? Yes, your magic spells, please. Yes, <laughs> yeah, in your absolutely. own time. Um, so my initial visits are an hour long. And so when I meet somebody for the first time, like I chat with them for an hour and I want to know everything. I want to see the last three years of, of blood work that you've had done because for women, blood work doesn't change dramatically overnight. Blood work is a shift over a number of years. Mm -hmm. We're really good at adapting to change. And so our bodies are also very good at adapting to change. 
So we don't, our blood work doesn't shift like our male counterparts does. It doesn't automatically go like, this is wrong. It's, it's a general trend over three or four years to be like, okay, your thyroid is tilting. Like every single year it's gotten slightly worse. Your iron is tilting every single year. It's gotten slightly lower. Your estrogen's off. Like we'll notice those trends. So we go through them and I look for them because hmm. the trends tell me more about what's going on with somebody's body, body than one number does. Um, And so in that initial visit, we sit down and we go through digestion, we go through your sleep, we go through what your periods look like, we go through what your lifestyle is. Are you working a 14 hour day? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you, do you have the support from a day-to-day basis? Do you have people you can call? Do you have friends? Do you feel like you're energized at the end of the day? Are you waking up rested? We go through everything that could potentially be health related, but also influence your health. Um, because like naturopathic medicine, functional medicine, call it what you will. The goal is, is prevention. And so the question that we're always trying to answer is, is what, what one or two things could we tweak or support that would have long lasting kind of benefits five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, because our goal is very much that you should live a very good, high quality life for a long period of time. And then you should die really quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which like people are like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I don't want you to spend your last like 10 years living in a nursing home. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. not quality of life to me. Yeah. And maybe that will change by the time I get there. And then I will completely change what I've just said. Um, but at <sighs> this point I was just like, I'd rather die at like 85 or 86 than live till a hundred, but not have good quality of life for the last 15 Mm. years. And so my goal as a practitioner is always to be like, what are those building blocks? What are those fundamentals? And how do we eliminate a lot of the noise? Because there's a lot of opinion out there on the internets. There's not a lot of science. And so the goal is to be like, okay, so that might sound really good, but does it fit your unique situation? Does that make sense? Is it financially like affordable? Is it time affordable? Does, Mm. is it something that you can continue doing for three, four, five, 10 years? I don't care if you can do something for two weeks. I care if you can do it for a year. I care if it has the outcomes five years from now. Mm -hmm. So we go through everything. Um, and then we come up with a plan. And so the plans are really simple. It's like, what's the critical factor? And a lot of people enter my office because something's wrong. And so they're like, I have, you know, PMD, like I, like PMDD is something that hits two weeks in that luteal phase, which I think we need to circle back around to, cause we just ended up at the follicular phase. Um, and, and so like, I feel like I'm about to yell at my boss every single day for two weeks. And that's just not the relationship that I want to be having. That's not what I want to do. That's not how I want to live or like, you know, I can't sleep. And so I'm exhausted throughout the day. So we're working on those fundamental kind of issues that those first couple of appointments. And then most of the time I see people one or two times a year and it's a check-in to be like, all right, what do we need to tweak? Where are things sitting? What's shifted in your life? Um, Mm -hmm. And with women, especially, we know that periods should generally shift every five to seven years. And so if you're coming coming into perimenopause, we're shifting things to support that process Mm. as opposed to, you know, you getting to 48 or 49 and then all of a sudden having 10 hot flashes a night, which just, in my opinion, doesn't seem worth it. Doesn't seem like a fun time. That just doesn't seem like something that I would enjoy. So like, no. what can we do ahead of time to just not let that happen? Um, and we expect it will happen for a little bit, but it's, it's always yeah. like, how do you speed up those transitions? Oh, I love that. I wanted to ask you about birth control. Um, I did, I've read a number of your articles on your website. You have a blog there, which I think is fabulous. I love your blog, by the way. Everyone should check out the blog. <laughs> Um, but I, and I know on, on your website, I noticed that you never said anything along the lines of birth control, not being good. I will caveat that I have recently stopped doing or using birth control for the first time since I was probably like 17, I want to say. So this has been a a lot of years, big change. And I have not felt so in sync with my body in like, I don't know if I've ever felt this in sync with my body. Um, but it was definitely a really interesting change. I just want to know 
obviously birth control is important and it's necessary, a necessary evil basically for a lot of people or maybe not evil. Um, but can you explain the pros and cons of birth control, what it can do or um, can't do for your body? Yeah, absolutely. I love this question. It's something I get to chat about all of the time. And and I think probably what you're talking about a little bit is hormonal birth control, specifically not necessarily yeah. non-hormonal birth control. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think that birth control pill is basically one of the best inventions that we've ever done for women, period. Um, I think it empowers women. I think it gives women the right to choose. I think it, it puts a lot of, of, it takes a lot of fear out of things. Um, but it doesn't come without its risks. And this is just part of a really good communication plan that I feel like personally we're missing a lot in how we talk about birth control. Um, and so there's there's two different types or three, four actually technically, two different types that most people know about. And there's a birth control pill or an IUD. And uh, there's also something like the Depo-Provera shot, which is, is an insert, which is um, more common in the UK and Europe there than it is in North America. Um, but basically what birth control does is it, it does one of two things. It either stops you from ovulating or it thins your uterine lining or it changes your cervical mucus. And so depending on what outcomes you want to achieve, we should be choosing birth control pills or, or IUDs that meet those outcomes. Um, and so the most common one to use from a, from an age perspective is a birth control pill. There's like 36 different birth control pills in the market right yeah. now. They all have slightly different levels of hormones, um, but there's combination pills and then there's there's progesterone only pills. And so in a combination pill, you get a type of estradiol and you get a type of, of progesterone, but they're not actually the same as the hormones that are in your body. They just mimic them. And so what we get then is a conversation around, well, how sensitive is your body to these fluctuating hormones? And that's, this is why you'll see these conversations with people of like, oh, I do really great on birth control pill. I don't notice anything different. And then you meet people who like, I've tried six different birth control pills. I mentally get hit. My mood changes. Like I have patients who were suicidal on birth control pills that we have to figure out a different way to kind of adapt that measure through. And so basically what it comes down to is how sensitive is your body and how strong are your body's hormones? If your body's hormones are naturally very strong in the sense of like you actually produce a higher level, which is genetically driven, then you're going to notice that your low dose birth control pills don't work as well. You spot, you have weird periods, like different things happen. And so you see this with women who are like, I had to try these like higher level birth control pills in order to regulate my period. And I say that very loosely because when you get a bleed on a birth control pill, it's not a true bleed. You're getting what we call a withdrawal bleed, which means it's just the lack of those hormones coming in through the pill. And you're just getting that uterine lining shift from it, which is why people are like, Oh, I went on a birth control pill. My periods are great. And I'm like, that's really good. I'm gl glad to hear that. But like, you're not actually having a period because what a birth control pill does is it stops your ovulation. So you basically get put into menopause. You don't ovulate. And so because wow. you, yeah. So because you're not ovulating, you're not getting those natural hormonal fluctuations. Mm -hmm. And so they can be really beneficial for helping to manage acne because they reduce the amount of circulating testosterone that you have. They can re be really beneficial for helping to manage cramps because you know, you're not actually getting a true bleed. Um, and I'm very pro quality of life. Like if it's really easy for you to take a pill right now, take the pill. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not getting these side effects, but like, you need to know that when you stop the pill, you're going to get all of these things coming back and you're going to have to deal with it at some point. Mm. And so I'm very pro, like absolutely use the birth control pill, but just recognize that there's, there's side effects to it. And you just have to be okay with that. Um, we generally try and do low dose pills because higher dose pills will have uh, higher levels of estrogen, which just to increase your risk of blood clots. And so genetically, again, if you already have a predisposition for blood clots, we really don't want you using a higher dose birth control pill. 
Um, and so when you're not ovulating, what you don't get the chance to do is work with those natural hormonal patterns that we talked about before. So like you're, you're not going to get that increase in estrogen. You're not going to get that creative spike. You're not going to get the testosterone that's naturally supposed to come up around ovulation, which means you're not going to get these surges of energy. You're not going to get this like great, like I can kick ass kind of time right now. And you're also not going to really get the downs as much and the calming kind of mechanisms that come with the progesterone that drives that second half of your cycle. Um, so that's just something you need to know. And so that's just what we call it in, in medicine is informed consent. So you just, you need to know this and you need to make the call based off of what's right for you. Can I um, ask, is, yeah. is it okay? Like, I mean, obviously it is okay because people do it, but my, my, my guts just don't like the idea of not of going into like temporary menopause or like, well, that's where an IUD comes in. Yes. But yeah, I know. I, I, I feel the same way. I just wonder, I wonder if like your body is meant to, to, to do that, you know, because I I actually have a copper IUD. I am, I have have a copper IUD. Yeah. Okay. So the copper IUD, um, and like the, the, and the IUDs are really great because what the IUDs don't do is they don't stop your ovulation, right? So you still actually release an egg, you still ovulate, which means you get your natural progesterone coming through. And, and the copper IUD is actually technically a non-hormonal birth control pill. Which is why I chose it. Yeah. It, and it's great. I love it. It's not so great if you've got a history of endometriosis or really heavy bleeding because it likes to trigger a heavy, heavier yeah. bleed, but it's in, in, in my very humble, broad sweeping opinion, if you're going to look for a birth control pill that really kind of does it all, you're really looking at that copper IUD because you get the fluctuations and your natural hormonal pattern, you get mm. a period but you also don't have these kind of external hormones coming into play. It changed my whole world. I have to say, like I was a monster on, (laughs) on pills. Like I tried different ones and I I had took them for like eight, nine years. I lost so much uh, swelling. Uh, I was not as bloated. I was not as, I mean, I'm still a monster. Let's just be really clear, but I'm now a monster of my own volition. So you're a monster because you choose to do it, not because something else is, <laughs> yes. is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. I want to know about yeah. the IUDs that have um, hormones in them. So for example, like the Mirena, I think there's another one called the Jessa or something. Yeah, Jessa. And there's a Kylina as well. And those okay. are all kind of what we call brand names. Um, and yeah. so it's whatever company makes it, it's kind of what the name of that, that IUD is. Hmm. Um, and so most of those are a progesterone based IUD. And so basically there's a, there's a hormone in, in that device that's inserted into your, your uterus and it gives off a lower amount of, of hormones than the pill would would actually have in it. And so they tend to last anywhere from two and a half to five years, just depending on how strong the hormonal cascade is. Um, And they tend to do quite a good job in terms of being able to give that safety net around the birth control aspect without necessarily completely overriding your own body's hormones. Um, One of the things that will come along with the IUDs generally that have hormones in them generally in the first couple of years is you may not get a a period. You might, um, both are completely normal reactions to the IUD. You can get spotting, you can get a full bleed, or you can get nothing. But generally as that, that IUD gets on in its life, you'll notice that you start to get some breakthrough spotting coming along. You might get a little bit of bloating. You might notice those pre-period symptoms starting to come through from a physical manner. Um, but even though it still has hormones, you are still ovulating. And so you're still getting your own natural cascade of hormones coming through. You're still getting that, that ability to kind of have, have the best, best of both worlds. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's interesting though, because, because like birth control and a hormonal birth control, especially it really like from a women's rights perspective, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It is. It's just, yes. there's actually mm-hmm. a lot of science that should be going into choosing which one is best. Um, and this is where you're starting to see the trend in, in terms of functional medicine, in terms of kind of how we work a little bit is like, 
we have the ability now to run your genetics. Let's see how mom did on a birth control pill. Let's now see how she might've done on an IUD. Let's piece your own genome together along with your family history, along with your own history and try and figure out what might be the best one to start with, as opposed to just like randomly picking one up off the shelf and be like, well, let's just start here. It's Mm -hmm. like, well, no, like mom has a history of fibroids, had a hysterectomy at 39. Okay. So there's probably a higher estrogen load going on. We probably need to take that into consideration. We also want to consider how kind of those, those methods of birth control may actually affect, um, your own fibroid development, but it's still like, it's not a perfect science, right? It's still, we're kind of taking this, this huge amount of options and whittling it down to two or three for our starting point and then going like, okay, let's make a logical decision from here. And I think it's so important as well to just understand that everyone is an individual human being and learning to listen to your body is just something that we're not taught nearly enough. I mean, I just finished a book on fasting and, uh, and I was just so fascinated by the fact that society doesn't help you to to, to look inwards. We don't, we don't talk about looking inwards nearly as much as we can and hopefully will, uh, going forward. Uh, but I, yeah, that's a really, it's, it's really important for us to kind of go, okay. Like when I, when I decided not to be on the pill anymore, I was like, I am really, really up and down. Like I'm a, I'm a creative. I'm, and, and quite stereotypically, my emotions live on the surface of my skin. You know, that's, that's my job. It's my job to write songs. It's my job to dig my guts out and put them on the table and be like, oh, okay, I'll just put this here. And this is going to be arranged here. And this is the feelings. Like, literally, gonna... it's what I'm supposed <laughs> to do. <laughs> yes. I, this is literally, that's my job. Um, uh, you know, gut wrenching things. But so as a result, it's like, I'm a more emotional person than, than maybe someone who is not exercising that muscle every day. I don't want that to interfere with what's happening hormonally. I know that I've been to a naturopath before that finally helped me understand that I'm suffering most likely from adrenal fatigue, which I'm sure, you know, when you talk about the the burnout, I'd like to uh, yeah have a mention on that because I think Adreset changed how I dealt with my life uh, in different ways, but it's unpacking these things, right? So like all you darlings listening, like everyone has those circumstances in their life, your predispositions, and it can feel so overwhelming. But I think the first thing that you said that was really important is go and get your bloods done. Go and get your bloods done and go and get some tests. You can't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. And this is, and, and this is where we, we see this kind of this meld into the gray zone of medicine is like, you have to be able to take those black and white numbers and those black and white pieces. And then they're just one layer, right? So mm. then you have to layer them on top of these, all of these other layers that you also have going on to be able to weed out like what's really, really critical for the person sitting in front of me. Mm-hmm. And that like, you could literally have the same blood work, but because people's layers are different, you have to be able to recognize that like, okay, so this might be important for person A, but person B that looks the same Mm. it's com- it's a completely different layer that's important. And so, and, and that's where that gray zone of medicine really comes into play. And it's also where in all honesty, you need to work with somebody that understands that like, this isn't just a simple, like yeah. in here's a script, go on your way. And that's the, that's the same for medications as it is for vitamins and supplements. Like if I'm doing my job right, you should be on less things because we're sinking in and going like, we need one thing or we need this, these two things to get that under control so that X, that. Y, and Z will all happen. Like it shouldn't be, here's my list of my, like, if you have a supplement cupboard, you like, <laughs> I'm not doing my job right. <laughs> I love that because yeah. I'm so intimidated by them. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, it's really important to go to the right person. So getting your blood work done is fine. But if you go generally to a general practitioner, all they're going to look at is, are you within a healthy range? Now, if you look at something like BMI, that's right. Like, you know, know that BMI doesn't work for women. (laughs) Um, Like, period. Like we all boobs, like BMI doesn't take that into account. (laughs) <laughs> at all. Um, but no, like you, you do need to, to create a team and, and this, the future of medicine 
I think is very much like one person and your medical team. It's no longer like you have one person, like you have your one practitioner who does everything. It's like, no, you need to pull from massage and physio and natural medicine and your general practitioners and your specialists and your internists. And you need everybody communicating to be able to make sense of what your body needs because one person doesn't hold all of the, the answers at all. I think that's, I think you could argue that for everything in life right now. We're just, you know, as a, as a, an evolving, I'm eternally hopeful to a more socially conscious and self-conscious society, you know, building these teams is so important because we also have to understand that we have so much more information. And so there's just not enough time in the day to disseminate all that information ourselves, nor is it of interest to me to try and do that. You mean you don't stay up until 11 (laughs) o'clock papers on, on this new, no, no. Okay. Just me. Cool. (laughs) I wish I, I wish, I mean, I want to subscribe to Blinkist so that I can just do that and just be like, mm, and I'm waiting for the day that the matrix is a thing where I can just do the plug Keanu the Reeves thing and plug in the thing and be like, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> Done. Uh, Done. That'll be a good time. If you figure that yeah. out, can you let me know? I want to come hang with I you. I would totally. Okay, yeah. Cool. You, yeah, Done. exactly. It'll be part of like our little cult introduction, <laughs> right? A cult introduction. Yes. Welcome. Here's your download card. Here's your but download I, card. <laughs> Let's go. From there. Yeah, exactly. I think women's oh. health is so interesting. Like, there's just so many aspects to it that we don't touch on, and and I don't know if it's purely generational, but I know like I bring up things to my mom all the time just to freak her out, and she's not like an old mom. She's a pretty young mom, but um, she's a cool mom. Just, She's a cool mom. <laughs> she's probably, she's going to be listening to this. Hi, mom. <laughs> it's okay. My mom's um, going to be listening to it too. She's like, what are you guys talking about? Yeah, all of our mothers are going to be it's like, so I heard funny. you on the other day. <laughs> it's okay. My but, mom edits my blog posts when they go up and she's like, you misspelled oh, about this word. And I was like, thanks, Janet. <laughs> like, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We all need that. Right? Yeah. But I think it's so important, like even, for example, how tampons are so readily used. And it always makes me question, like, what is inside of these? And then we're putting it in a really like porous, open area that can take out anything that are in them. Like for the last, I want to say, a couple years, I stopped using them and I feel so much better myself. But I mean, there's the sustainable aspect of it. There's the chemical aspect of it. Um, There's like foods with different hormones that can set off your already natural hormones stacked on top of birth control hormones and other types of hormones. (laughs) All of the hormones, all of the hormones. But this is the thing, like, is we're seeing like, like girls are getting their periods at a younger and younger age, right? Like they're developing far more breast tissue than like the three of us Mm -hmm. have ever developed at a much younger and younger age. Um, (laughs) Maybe I'm speaking for myself, but like our age range, right? And so like, you've got these like 12, 13, 14 year olds with like bigger boobs than I ever had when I was like 29. And I was like, what is going on? on here. Mm. Um, and so environmentally, like we do have to recognize that there's, there's a, there's an impact that external forces have on our internal hormones. Um, and that's kind of when we talk about burnout, when we talk about kind of everything, we're going like, what's the external force? What's the internal force? The internal force is generally our body's reactions to things. The external force are generally things that we can control we can't always control what our hormones are going to do. They're really great tipping points, but they're also a little bit heightened. They like to react to things that maybe they don't need to react. They're high to. maintenance. <laughs> just a little bit. Um, and so it's just, and, and that's that part of the hormonal cascade that we go like, okay, but you're also allowed to like have a weird cycle every once in a while, mm. right? Like the weird cycle that most people have is like the February to March one, because you binged over Christmas and you ate and drank more than you normally do. And you didn't move as much. And like your stress load was higher, but then it was less at the same time. So everybody has a super wonky February, March cycle, <laughs> but and also it's 100% because of that, it's the pandemic. So does that mean that now just every month is that now? Well, your hormones work in three month cycles. Oh, and so it takes three months for your hormones to turn over. And so generally, if you have a wonky cycle, you need to go back three months and be like, 
what was going on there. Like wow. start of the pandemic was most, most of the lockdowns happened all in March. Mm. People skipped periods left, right, and center in June. Wow. Like to the point that, yeah, we were talking about it in like Forbes and like, like entrepreneur magazine. We're like, Oh, everybody's having like a weird, like period month. And I was like, no, your hormones are literally adjusting to the fact that you, the entire world just went into lockdown three months ago. That's that cell turnover. And so we're allowed to have wonky hormone cycles every once in a while because life happens every once in a while. And so it's, it's really important to take that with a grain of salt and go like, okay, so I need to not react quickly right now because this is something that, you know, happened three months ago. And so like the conversation I get to have with my patients every single day is like, that's okay. So that's a really weird cycle. You're bang on that. It was really weird. Your PMS was worse. Like your flow was worse. Like you had worse cramps. We need to not do anything right now because that could be a one-off. And if it was a one-off, we need to not be adjusting things because it's actually not going to happen again. Mm. And so that's where like women's health is incredibly preventative because it never quick fixes. You can't do quick fixes with hormones. It doesn't exist. You can shut them down by like with a birth control pill or something like that, but you actually, there's no such thing as a quick fix for hormones because it's such a long-term change. Can you just pay me? Yeah. Yeah, Pay me that quick picture of the opposite then of the, of the opposite of the, the quick pick, the quick. Yeah. Like men, people that have a lot more like of the testosterone or like, you know, yeah, guys, the opposite side. Testosterone turns over in 24 hours. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a 24 hour turnover. You're constantly creating more testosterone. You're constantly changing over. Sperm is a 64 day cycle, but testosterone literally regenerates almost every 24 hours. Whereas like estrogen, progesterone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, they're all happening over these massive three month pictures. So when you're communicating, okay. Yeah, you know where I'm going to go with this. I do. <laughs> when you're communicating really with friends, with other people, with partners, with whoever it is that you're with that's the that's the opposite sex to you, how do you have this conversation without just forcing this podcast on Ooh. to them in with really high levels for people to understand like what you have the answer <laughs> Raquel? <laughs> I tell my boyfriend he's lucky because He's the luckiest man ever because he gets a new woman almost every day. (laughs) That might be amazing. (laughs) So what, so how do you, I mean, because that's a big, that'll be a big question, right? Is how do you, how do you encourage people? A lot of the conversations about periods were preaching to the choir. People like, oh yeah, we get that. But those people are people who get periods and the people who don't get periods are like, you're crazy. You're a crazy person. And I'm like, well, that's not the point as I smash 15 glasses on the floor and make that person tread on them. So like, I, okay, just to verify though, right? Like, are you asking like how you have a valid conversation about how you're feeling with somebody who doesn't understand what it's like to actually feel different on a day-to-day basis? I don't know. I guess I'm asking, how do you point those people into a, in a present them with information that, that they might better understand based on the fact that they're not personally experiencing it themselves. I talk about it like a bucket. So okay. we all have a, we all have a bucket that we carry. Um, and basically there's a pile of internal things that go into that bucket that makes it heavier. And there's external things that can go into that bucket and it makes it heavier. And the perfect tipping point for burnout is when that bucket overflows. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is if you're living a really kind of healthy lifestyle that works for you is you have stuff going into the bucket, but you also have stuff draining from the bucket at the same time. And so our, our nutrition, our sleep, our, our movement, our kind of boundaries that we place are, are what control the size of the bucket. And so sometimes the bucket's a lot smaller if there's more things going on. Sometimes the bucket's a lot larger if you have really great coping mechanisms. And if you've got a larger bucket, then you can put more things in it before you get to this tipping point. Mm -hmm. Um, And then sometimes shit happens, right? Like you've got a death in the family, you lose your job, like a global pandemic hits X, Y, and Z. (laughs) Those are things that go into the bucket that you can't control, right? Mm -hmm. You can't control that, that side of things. You just have to adapt to it. So the 
goal is that your bucket is as large as it can be when, so that when those things hit, it doesn't take as much out of you. Right. Um, our hormones as women also impact how big our bucket is. And so first half of our cycle, our follicle, our follicular part of our cycle, our bucket is a lot bigger because there's only really one hormone at play. Well, there's two, but really one at play and it's just constantly rising, right? So there's not a ton of stuff going on. Second half of your cycle, you've got progesterone coming into play. You have estrogen dropping out and then bouncing back up and dropping out again. You have the breakdown of all of those, those hormones happening. And then they both basically take a sliding go to the bottom of the hill at the same time, in which case our buckets as women just become like little toddler buckets, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's a lot more things going on. And so for women, our bucket is also controlled by, by our hormones. And so we can be doing everything right, but we can still have that horse hormone slide, which tilts our bucket out. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And can you tell us, I mean, I think women know, but I also think women don't know sometimes what hormones can actually do. So there's the emotional side, of course, and there's mm-hmm. energy, but then there's weight gain or loss, then there's hair loss, then all of these other things. Like, can you, can you run the gamut as, as much as you can, if it's not too much, just to yeah, totally. let people know, like, when should they get these checked? Um, also, and I think if, if men also understood more, both the mental, emotional and physiological For some reason, physiological seems to be the one that people understand the most. But if they understand, like, this is creating both physical changes as well as emotional changes, um, it seems to have a little bit more gravity. And I think that's maybe an easier way to also explain it and depict it. Yeah. So as we talked about before, like estrogens are basically our creative superpower. It's our energy up. It has really positive effects as estrogens rising. We're not too, too worry about it. It's when estrogen starts to drop and we have to break it down that that puts a pile of stress on, on other parts of our, our body. Um, and so estrogen is, is kind of that driving force. It lays down the initial uterine linings. So you actually lay down two uterine linings. Um, throughout a cycle, you don't lay down one, you lay down two. Um, and so estrogen is the initial uterine lining that's, that's, that's put down that basically melds into our uterus and creates more blood flow. Um, and then as we ovulate progesterone comes into play and there's two different types of progesterone. There's an alpha progesterone and a beta progesterone. So one of those progesterones goes direct to uterus and lays down that secondary uterine lining that, that theoretically, if you were to have an egg that get that, that got a sperm to it and all of the good things happened because I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, <laughs> fertilized. There's my word. If the egg there gets fertilized, there it came through. If the egg gets fertilized, then it, it, it lands into that progesterone based uterine lining. Um, but progesterone also hits our brain. And so it's our calming hormone. It's supposed to chill us out and calm us down. It hits the GABA receptors in our brain, which is literally GABA is our calming neurotransmitter. And so the, the easiest way to think about progesterone is progesterone is supposed to be your buffer. So you've got all kinds of fluctuations going on with estrogen. You have all kinds of breakdown pathways in the second half of your cycle progesterone is supposed to buffer that through. So you literally don't feel like you're going to lose your shit every single month, but Mm. progesterone, uh, competes with cortisol Mm. out of it. It's, it's, it's maker. So there is good friend, cortisol, our good friend, (laughs) cortisol. And this is where the conversation gets a little bit more complicated because it's nuanced. Right. And so our hormones are always kind of working in a ratio to each other. So this thing that you see online where everybody's like, do you have estrogen dominance? I don't know if you guys have, have read that stuff. Yeah. Okay, Raquel's going to, yeah. Okay. You're supposed to be estrogen dominant. You're supposed to have more estrogen in your body, but estrogen gets this really awful rap for being, um, related to, um, weight gain and to swelling and to breast tenderness. Um, and that's actually not true. Um, but estrogen is what we call a pro-inflammatory hormone. 
And so we don't like to have too much circulating estrogen going on. And so if our body thinks that we have too much estrogen and not enough progesterone, it will store that estrogen because estrogen is, is what creates inflammation and we don't like inflammation in large amounts. And so it will store estrogen in what's considered to be the safest place to store a hormone, which is inside fat or adipose tissue. Mm. And so we start to lay down more adipose tissue as that ratio between estrogen and progesterone get out of line. And so we start to gain weight. We start to retain fluid. We start to, like our rings fit differently before our cycle. And that's because of that inflammatory reaction of estrogen not getting broken down as well as it needs to. Um, estrogen is supposed to tell us where to gain weight. We should gain weight in our hips and our thighs. That's the really healthy place to gain weight. We, like we're supposed to. I got weight. that on lock. <laughs> I do too. I think my hips have gotten wider than any place else on my body throughout the pandemic. Um, but I was like, okay, so at least it's gaining there. Um, but if we don't have enough circulating estrogen, then progesterone and cortisol drive that weight gain, cortisol specifically, and we gain it around our midsection. But that's the type of fat that likes to sit on our organs and it's really hard to lose. And it also like increases our blood pressure and it changes, it, like it hits every single box that you don't necessarily want to tick. And so when it comes to kind of healthy weight management with a hormonal access, we generally always look at estrogen in terms of like, let's just help break it down faster so that we don't have to put it into adipose tissue to get it out of our bloodstream. And that's that really kind of push and pull conversation with women specifically around weight is that we think it's really simple, but it's actually a conversation between like 22 different hormones as to what makes that happen. Wow. That's insane. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so- we just need to have more time built into the day. Like I look forward to uh, the future CEOs, the future generations, making it really important for us to build lifestyle into our lives. Because, you know, you, you think about an eight hour work day and I know that things are shifting and I'm, I'm hopeful that things will be a lot more flexible than they were, but this this takes time. There needs to be time put aside. It needs to be normalized. It needs to be humanized. It needs to be, you know, kind of, uh, introduced at a very young age that this is part of us building a good lifestyle. And I do recognize that we're in a very privileged position to say that, but if we don't think it, we don't do it we have to be talking about this, knowing that it might not affect us. Like, I think it will really affect us in like a, like we can put those initial building blocks in place. Yeah. But I truly believe that we're doing this work for the next generation of women coming through. I Um, agree. And part of that comes down to like the biohacking of your hormones, right? Like we have this biohacking ability that tells women that like, okay, so three days before your cycle, guess what? You got four good hours. Let's be honest. Like you've got four hours in your day. (laughs) Ovulation, you could work for 14 hours and you would be totally fine. Mm. Right. But try and do 14 hours of work three days before your cycle. You're tanked out. You're done. Like you need 48 hours of recovery from that. It's not possible. Mm. And so I I think what we really need to normalize for the next generation of, of women and men coming through is this expectation. Like you do what you need to do the job and how you do it is really up to you because like guys will work best on a seven hour work day, come in Monday through Friday, do it cool. Women work best when there's a fluctuation allowed. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to work with my system. So like I'll kick ass for 14 hours right around ovulation, but then like three days before my cycle, I'm out. I was like, Mm -hmm. I'll answer emails. I'll stay on top of stuff, but like, I'm going to go chill on the couch. And it's understanding that on both ways. And so I, that's, uh, we could talk for hours and days and I will probably just continue to be like, Hello. Hello. Hey, I have a question. What are you doing now? What are yeah. you doing now? I do. Uh, I do like that a little while ago, you raised your hand. I was like, I feel like I'm a science teacher right now. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but I want to talk very quickly, just as we're, as we're closing out here, this has just been so incredibly uh, invigorating and kind of uh, just so inspiring to, to know that we can go down this path and there's more, more and more information coming out by the day. But tell me about 
uh, the burnout blueprint. Tell me, because that you wrote an article about how slowing down doesn't necessarily fix burnout, which trust me, I am so happy to hear because when I, I'm the type of person that's like, run, 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 die. Yeah. <laughs> run, 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 <laughs> melt into puddle. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, I also don't want to slow down necessarily. I love my relaxing breaks, but I, I know that I, I love to work on you stress and not like de-stress. And I love to have these joyous things that I'm running towards the, uh, um, sustaining me. Tell me a little bit about the burnout blueprint. Tell me, tell us all what that's about. And, and I'm so grateful that you're going to give us all a chance to get to it. Yeah. So, so burnout is, is your colloquial term that's come from the pandemic. I think, um, like I've been treating it for five years in clinical practice. Like this isn't a new thing. Like we've been studying it for 30 years. Like it's just, we've hit these tipping points with just society where everybody's just hitting these walls. And so what burnout is, is this just really apathetic, low kind of mood, like no energy kind of approach to work. Um, and if you're on the video, YouTube, you can see me doing that very loosely. Um, because really what, what burnout is, is your body's just, it's hit its wall and it can't cope anymore. It can't adapt. It takes too much energy to adapt to things to be able to get through. And so we are starting to see it in terms of productivity. We're starting to see it in terms of like, we have rising mental health conversations that need to be looked at. Um, but really what it comes down to is, is, are you burning out? And so what's out there on, on the internet's is, oh, well, go for a walk, eat some healthy meals, like make sure that you take time to rest, turn your phone off before bed and da, 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 da. And I'm like, those are all great. Those are all awesome. But those don't help prevent burnout. Those don't build you back from burnout. Those are, those are markers of a really healthy lifestyle, but they're not enough to get you through burnout. And so what we did with burnout blueprint is a, we wanted to make it accessible. Um, I don't need you to be in Nova Scotia in order to access that because it's, it's education based and what's missing out there right now is an actual conversation about what burnout actually is and how does it affect all of these different parts of your lives. And so we've walked people through, here's the research on nutrition with burnout. Here's the research on, on sleep with burnout. Here's the research on movement with burnout. Um, and the goal with kind of developing through burnout and developing kind of a healthy coping mechanism afterwards is you take all the, the information that we've given in this literally 11 module course and I'm like, okay, how do I apply it to my day to day? What do I need to do to put supports in place? Because when it comes down to burnout, putting a support in place that involves a slowing down doesn't work mm. because you just come right back to the environment that's causing it in the first place. So why would I ask you to go take a vacation when the vacation is just going to make you recognize more how burnt out you are in your day to day? Like that's not going to fix it. Mm. Um, a four day work week might be a really great idea. And trust me, like I love a four day work. Week. We have a four day work week. Um, but it also isn't just like the check the box, go to a four day work week there at four, you won't get burnt out anymore. Um, yeah. one of the biggest tipping points towards burnout right now is, is managers right? Be always being on and setting these expectations that aren't able to be delivered, that you have to be available all of the time, that you have to be go, 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 go. Um, but like, that's just not worth it for the majority of the population. And so we've tried to really give the baseline, here's what you can actually do that's going to pull you back out of burnout because God knows you need it. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about this later, but I, I just wanted to say thank you because you've given us oh, so a, a, such a great insight into everything, but you've also given us a, a, our very own bombshell branches discount code for any of you listening who want to take the burnout blueprint call. Yeah. So it's bomb, bombshell 20. And I think, um, you guys can pop that through in the show notes. Yes. yes, absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Awesome. absolutely. Um, and we'll pop it through to how you can actually log on, um, to burnout blueprint and access it, but it is, it is the literal only course out there available online. That's evidence-based that has the science behind it. That's actually going to get you through to thriving in your own life. And I will say that again and again and again is the goal is to not take a million things to then pretend that you're doing okay. It's to get you back up and running so you can make the environmental shifts 
that caused the burnout in the first place. You can actually literally design a life that works for you. Oh, I love it. And you can do that at 40% off. Thank Amazing. you so, so You're much. You're so welcome. <laughs> oh. Well, that just wraps that up beautifully. What I do want to say is where can we find you on Instagram and where can we find the Superwoman Code podcast as well? Because we'll be listening to that on the regular. Oh, I love it. So you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Ashley Margison, um, which is very easy. You can find me on Facebook as well on that side of things. Um, and you can find the Superwoman Code on any major podcast platform. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. Um, we release an episode every single Tuesday. Um, they're about 12 to 18 minutes in length. So they're really easy listening. Oh, um, and they're all evidence-based and, and teaching you really how to support your hormones, but also how to bounce back from burnout. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're so welcome. This was great. I can't wait till we can actually have brunch together. Yay. Yes. You know. <laughs> Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.